Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. Glad to have you following along <clears throat> on our Lenten services as we are uh, coming forward to the commemoration and the remembrance of the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Today we'll be reading from Luke chapter 19, verse 45 through 20, verse 7. And the title of the message is Of Heaven or Men. But before we read, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you gave us your word to reveal your character. We catch glimpses of your power. We catch glimpses of your vast knowledge in the complexity and the beauty of the creation that you have established. But you reveal to us your character in your word. You reveal to us your holiness. You reveal to us your great and infinite mercy and loving kindness. And we ask that you would search our hearts and soften our hearts through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 19, 45 through 20, verse 7. <clears throat> this is speaking of Jesus. Then he went to the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him, but were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes together with the elders confronted him and spoke to him saying, tell us by what authority are you doing these things or who is he who gives you this authority? But he answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us. For they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. Amen. Back to verse 45 of chapter 19. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. Now, <clears throat> The, the word that's translated temple refers specifically to the outer court or the court of the Gentiles. The only place in, in, that, in that time that Gentiles who wanted to come, who wanted to worship the true and the living God had permission to go. They could not go to the inner court. They most certainly could not go into the Holy of Holies, but, but only Jews could go into the inner court and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. But, but Gentiles could worship in the outer court. And what you see here is um, the outer court, the only place where the Gentiles could go, had been turned into a marketplace, and effectively crowding out most of the space where Gentiles, if they did choose to come and worship, would have in order to do that. Uh, I encourage you to to look at the comparative uh, passage in Matthew 21, 12 through 16, but I would like to read from Mark 11, 15 through 17. Mark 11, 15 through 17. My book doesn't want to lay flat. <laughs> And I'd like to draw your attention to verse um, 16 in this. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. <clears throat> so again, this, this had not only been turned into a marketplace, but it had been turned into a place where not only where the vendors had their stalls where they would sell uh, sacrifices that had been uh, previously accepted. 
to offer for sacrifices, but they would also renew the supply that they had by going through the temple, uh, effectively further reducing the amount of space for worshipers. Um, <clears throat> and he taught, saying to them, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? He's drawing their attention to, that, that God had chosen his people not just to have one isolated people as the only people on the face of the earth who worshiped the God who created the heavens and the earth, but he desired his people, his chosen people, the Jewish people, to be a witness, to be a standard of his righteousness for the entire earth. Um, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, this was not the first time that he had cleansed the temple. Because in John's gospel, uh, John chapter 2, 13 through 21, and I, I encourage you to look that up, uh, immediately after his baptism and his time of uh, being tempted in the wilderness, he had gone to the, the temple approximately three years before that and done much the same thing. Uh, so things had returned to their normal corrupt ways over the passage of approximately three years. And he had to do it again in much the same way. Uh, God doesn't just give up on us when we uh, mess up. He doesn't give up on us the first time and say, I'm through with you. If necessary, he'll cleanse us again and again out of his great love and mercy for us. He doesn't want us to continue in those ways. Now, <clears throat> Jesus says, uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. In our responsive reading, we read from Jeremiah 7, and I, I do encourage you to go back and look verses 8 through 11, but I also would like to refer to Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. Where the prophet Isaiah is also pointing out the true worship that God desired from his people. And also pointing out that he was calling a people to himself, not just from the Jewish people, but from those who are of foreign nations. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. At that time, and in Jesus' time, Jesus was pointing out that, that he desired for his place to be a place for those of all nations, of all backgrounds, to be able to come to him in true worship. That's still his desire. In his, in his final kingdom, he will rule and reign over those of every nation, those of every background, of every conceivable background, will be part of his heavenly kingdom. Go back to uh, Luke 19. And he was teaching daily in the temple. So during this time, prior to his arrest, he was, and every day he would go to the temple. This is after the triumphal entry. He has gone back to the temple to cleanse it, and he's teaching every day in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. Now, there are some examples, some more specific examples of this in the Gospel of John, but I would like to refer specifically to John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. For this reason, the Jews, now, <clears throat> when John in his gospel refers to the Jews, he's not speaking of the Jews as, as a whole people, but he's referring to those who are in positions of authority as far as the, um, the uh, religious and legal structure. They persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. This is referring to he had just healed a man. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working till now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, 
making himself equal with God. Now, the, the Jewish authorities rightly understood that Jesus was claiming to be equal with the Father. They rightly understood, and they, they jumped to the wrong conclusion when they accused him of blasphemy. And that would have been blasphemous if he hadn't been equal with the Father, but since he was also equal to the Father and God himself, he was not blasphemous in saying that. John 8, 37 through 47, and I would like to read just verse 37, but I do encourage you to, to read the whole thing. John 8, 37 through 47. Now, this is after Jesus has proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. And this is during the, uh, the Feast of Lights, or, or what we refer to as Hanukkah. Um, he's referred to himself as the light of the world. And he's saying to um, the Jewish leaders, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And Jesus' word is, is much the same way even now. Because Jesus said things of himself, and he performed the miracles to back them up that don't allow us to merely say, well, he was, he was a great man. He was a wonderful man. He was a prophet. He was a great person, but, but he, was, he was just a man. We either have to embrace his words, or if we don't embrace his words, we have to reject his words we have to hate his words because they they demand a response they they, de they demand our worship and, and either we are willing to do that or we reject that and if we reject that then we are left with with hating his claims and essentially with hating him wanting to destroy those claims in our own hearts speaking again of the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders desiring to destroy him, but were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. In Luke 21, 37 and 38, a little further, Jesus has been teaching. And it says, in the daytime, he, Jesus, was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So one of the chief obstacles that the, uh, <clears throat> those who desired to destroy Jesus faced was how to turn the Jesus popularity against him, to turn the people against him, because at that time he was very popular. The people were listening to him much more than they were to anyone else. Now, in chapter 20, verses 1 through 8, it speaks of the questioning of Jesus' authority. And you'll have parallel passages in Matthew 21, 23 through 27, and Mark 11, 27 through 33. Um, and I encourage you to look at that. But I would like to, to read just a little bit of this um, and then go on to verse 2. And it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes, together with the elders, confronted him and spoke to him, saying, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? <clears throat> now, um, this can be a legitimate question. God doesn't mind legitimate questions. As a matter of fact, he welcomes legitimate questions. There are questions we ask because we want to know the answer to. There are also questions that we may ask, and probably most of us learn to do this when we were real young with our parents, because we already know the answer, but we want to see if we can kind of work our way in and shift things around and maybe get a little different answer, or maybe turn one against the other. Uh, now, <clears throat> Jesus, being omniscient, 
knew that this was not a legitimate question because Jesus more than once had already plainly proclaimed himself to be the Messiah of God. And, and as a matter of fact, the, uh, he had faced the accusation of blasphemy because of it. And, and so they already knew what Jesus was claiming, that they were looking for something to accuse him. And Jesus knows this, and, and that's why he goes on with the answer that he gives them. Instead of giving them a direct answer, he asks them a question in response. But uh, <clears throat> there is a, a similar question of authority in Acts chapter 4, verse 7. And this is after Peter and John have healed a man and proclaimed in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, the entire story is as Peter and John have been brought before the Sanhedrin and are standing trial. And that's verses 5 through 14. But I would like to read just verse 7. And when they, the Sanhedrin, had set them, Peter and John, in the midst, they asked, by what power? Or by what name have you done this? It's, it's a question being asked of who gave you the authority to do this? Is, is this just something you're doing on your own? Or is this something that you're claiming some sort of power to do? And so it's a similar question here. Who gave you that authority? Verse 3, but Jesus, knowing that they weren't really that interested in his claims, had already heard his claims knowing they were challenging him, he answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? It's really a very similar type of a question. It was, it was a question of uh, the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees was a question of Jesus' authority. Jesus is asking them the question of John's authority. <clears throat> and he refers to the baptism of John. Now, the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance, as uh, John 1, 19 through 31 says, and we'll read just a little bit from that, but John came preaching in the wilderness a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who would come after him. Now, this is the testimony of John, uh, John 1, 19. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He, an he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you, that we may give an answer to those who sent you, sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Jesus said, John answered them, sorry, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, John gives his testimony. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now, as John is saying in this last verse, I didn't know my own cousin. I don't think so. I think what John is saying here is that I did not recognize him as the Messiah who was to come until he came to receive the baptism. And John also saw the sign of the Holy Spirit coming upon him like a dove and heard the voice from heaven with the Father's testimony. So Jesus asks, the Sanhedrin, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Now they are now on the horns of a dilemma. And so they reason among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? Because for the most part, 
the Sanhedrin did not believe in the baptism of John. Now, granted, from their perspective, if you go out to see some crazy guy dressed in camel's hair, eating a high yuck diet of locusts and wild honey, and you're a respected leader of the community, and he calls you a brood of vipers, that's not exactly the kinds of words that are likely to promote uh, friendly feelings. <laughs> so th there was no, no lost love between most of the Sanhedrin and John, but they, they didn't recognize that the people believed John to be a true prophet from God. And they knew that if they answered that, that John was speaking on his own authority, they were going to be in trouble with the people. But as Jesus said, you know, if they said that John spoke from heaven, well, um, his question stands, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, verse 6, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. Now, there's a nice, safe answer. It's an answer that we're all prone to. And again, most of us probably learned that from, from the time we were real little. Who broke your brother's toy? Well, I don't know. Well, that may be the case. On the other hand, it may be that my brother had the toy, and I really wanted the toy, so I grabbed it from him, and there was a little uh, altercation that ensued, and the toy got broken. And I know perfectly well who broke my brother's toy, but after all, it was his fault because he should have given it to me just because I wanted it. Well, you know, is a six-year-old or seven-year-old or five-year-old, we know, we know that that answer probably isn't going to go real well with mom or dad. So, so we resort to the old tried and true, I don't know. And uh, they did the same thing. <laughs> in, some way, in some ways, it takes us a long, long time to grow up. We get older, but sometimes it takes us a really long time to grow up. Um, so they answered that they did not know where that authority was from. Now, John's is referred to, and I'd like to refer back to Luke chapter 7, 24 through 30. Now, this is the story where, where John has been imprisoned, not for doing something wrong, but for confronting a wicked king who is not used to being confronted and has no appreciation for being confronted. John 7, 24 through 30, and I'll just read a, a few things from it. And, and John has been imprisoned, and during that time, he has gone through some struggles with doubts. And he has sent messengers to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come? At that time, <clears throat> Jesus knew that this was, not, this was not a challenge to his authority, that John just needed someone to encourage him. And, John, and Jesus sends that encouragement to John. When the messengers of John had departed, he, Jesus, began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Now, that's appropriate because John has just sent messengers to ask. But, but Jesus is giving his uh, support to the ministry that John had. But what did you go to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in the king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before me. For I say unto you, that among those born of women there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is less least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. 
But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So it's that old conflict that comes up again in, uh, in the question of authority that the Sanhedrin brings before Jesus. I would also like to read from Mark chapter 6, 17 through 20. Now, what we have just read is Jesus' uh, declaration of the ministry and the authority of John. Now, in Mark 6, we have a declaration from a very different source. Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. Now, this is after John has been beheaded. And Jesus' ministry has begun. And this is the uh, proclamation, this is the thoughts of Herod. Starting at verse 16, but when Herod heard of it, heard of Jesus' miracles, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now from a from a worldly standpoint, did Herod have any reason at all to fear John? I mean, from a worldly standpoint, who was the one who had all the power in his hands? Here's Herod. He had the backing of Rome. I mean, he wasn't a king that had authority on his own, but he did have the backing of Rome as long as he could maintain peace. Then he had the, he had the full military backing of Rome, and yet Herod feared John because Herod knew just enough of the holiness of God to have a fear of the holiness of God. Not a fear that led to faith. There's no record of Herod ever coming to a place of faith. But he had just enough fear to fear God's judgment, and John was a representative of that because John would not shut up. He just wouldn't. John didn't know what was good for him. From an earthly standpoint, from an earthly standpoint, he had nothing to gain and everything to lose, and he lost his head, literally. <laughs> uh, but John represented God's character to Herod, and because of that, Herod had just enough knowledge of God to fear John, to fear <coughs> the holiness of God that he was that he Herod was not willing to embrace. And because he was not willing to embrace the holiness of God and embrace the mercy of God, he was left not with nothing but the judgment of God. In the same way, Jesus comes presenting the holiness and the mercy of God. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life that, that no one, even his enemies, could accuse him of any sin. Well, the only sin that they could kind of make stick was blasphemy because he did claim to be God. But because he was God, it wasn't really a sin. But even his enemies couldn't really come up with a claim that would stick. So he re represents the holiness of God. He also represents the mercy of God in taking every one of our sins upon himself. And we can, we can either embrace his holiness and his mercy and cling to him as Savior and Lord. Or we can reject him entirely and be, and be left with nothing but having to face the holiness of God upon our sins. And <clears throat> as we remember in this season, we remember again how great is the mercy of Jesus and taking our sins upon himself so that we don't have to face God's judgment. 
that he took his, that he took upon himself the penalty for every one of my sins, for every one of your sins, for every sin that we've ever done in our body or in our hearts or in our minds. He took the penalty for every one of those things so that we could trust in him and find life. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you so much that you've made that life available to those who will trust in you. You've given your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts to draw us to you or to strengthen our love for you. And we face many distractions in this life, many things that clamor for our attention. We ask that you would still our hearts, that we can receive your word in your life and live in that. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you. Thank you very much.